Hello and welcome to the second part of the lecture on body organization. This is Dr. Stewart and I'll be taking you through this lecture. So let's go ahead and get started. Yet another way of dividing and describing the body is by using body cavities. As you may know, the body is not a solid structure. It has many open spaces. These spaces are referred to as cavities. There are two dorsal cavities, the cranial cavity and the spinal cavity. The cranial cavity contains the brain and the spinal cavity contains the spinal cord. There are also two ventral cavities, which can be further subdivided. We'll discuss these on the following slides. The first of the ventral cavities is the thoracic cavity, which contains both lungs. It also contains a central region between the lungs called the mediastinum. The mediastinum contains the heart, aorta, esophagus, trachea, and the thymus gland. The second of the ventral cavities is the abdominopelvic cavity. The abdominopelvic cavity is separated from the thoracic cavity by the diaphragm, a muscle used for breathing. Within the abdominal cavity, the superior or upper portion is the abdominal cavity. The inferior or lower portion is the pelvic cavity. These cavities contain the digestive, excretory, and reproductive organs. This figure illustrates dorsal and ventral views of the body cavities. The organs in the ventral cavities are referred to as the internal organs or viscera. The viscera are encased in a double-layered membranous sac. The outer layer of the sac is the parietal layer. The inner layer of the sac is the visceral layer, which contacts the viscera. Within the th thoracic cavity, the membranous sac is called the pleura. Within the abdominopelvic cavity, the sac is called the peritoneum. Within the thoracic cavity, the pleura is subdivided into two cavities. The first cavity is the pleural cavity. It surrounds the lungs. The second cavity is the pericardial cavity. It surrounds the heart. The abdominopelvic cavity is a large portion of the body. In order to identify specific areas more easily, this cavity can be divided into regions. There are two different methods for subdividing the abdominopelvic cavity. The first method is known as the anatomical division and is shown on this slide. This method is much like drawing a tic-tac-toe board on a patient's abdomen. It breaks the abdominopelvic cavity into three rows with three squares in each row. In the upper row, the right and left regions are called the right and left hypochondriac regions. The middle region is the epigastric region you can remember these by, remember, by remembering that epigastric means pertaining to above the stomach, and hypochondriac means pertaining to below the cartilage. In the middle row, the right and left regions are the right and left lumbar regions, and the middle region is the umbilical region. You can remember these because the navel, or umbilicus, is in the umbilical region and the lumbar regions are in line with the lumbar vertebrae of the back. In the bottom row, the right and left regions are the right and left inguinal regions, and the middle region is the hypogastric region. The second method for subdividing the abdominopelvic cavity is known as the clinical division. This method divides the abdomen into four quadrants, as shown on this slide. The quadrants are named the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, and the left lower quadrant. We'll discuss the organs that fall in these quadrants on the following slides. You should note that some organs fall along the midline rather than being in a particular quadrant. In both genders, the bladder is a midline organ. In the female, the uterus is also in the midline. In the male, the prostate gland is in the midline. An important thing to remember when using these quadrants 
is that the right and left designations refer to the patient's right and left as you are looking at him or her, not your right and left. The right upper quadrant, commonly referred to as the RUQ, contains the majority of the liver, the right kidney, the colon, a small portion of the pancreas, the gallbladder, and the small intestine. The right lower quadrant, or RLQ, contains the colon, the small intestine, the right ureter, and the appendix. In the female, this quadrant also is going to contain the right ovary and the right fallopian tube. The left upper quadrant, also known as the LUQ, contains a small portion of the liver, the spleen, the left kidney, the stomach, the colon, the majority of the pancreas, and the small intestine. The left lower quadrant, or LLQ, contains the colon, the small intestine, and the left ureter. In the female, we're also going to find the left ovary and the left fallopian tube. Directional terms are used by medical personnel to describe a position or to describe the location of a patient's complaint. These terms also help describe a process, organ, or system as it relates to another. On the following slides, the directional terms are shown alongside their opposites. Superior or cephalic means more toward the head. For example, the eyes are superior to the lips. Inferior or caudal means more toward the feet. For example, the feet are inferior to the knees. Anterior or ventral means more toward the front or belly side of the body. For example, the nose is located on the anterior side of the body. Posterior or dorsal means more toward the back or spinal cord side of the body. For example, the buttocks are on the posterior side of the body. Medial means more toward the middle or midline of the body. For example, the sternum is medial to the arm. Lateral means more toward the side. For example, the arms are lateral to the heart. Proximal means located nearer to the point of attachment to the body. For example, the knee is proximal to the foot. Distal means located farther from the point of attachment to the body. For example, the hand is distal to the elbow. This figure gives anterior and lateral views of the body, illustrating the directional terms discussed on the previous slides. We will discuss even more directional terms on the following slides. Apex refers to the tip or summit of an organ. For example, the apex of the lung is at the clavicle. Base refers to the bottom or lower part of an organ. For example, the base of the lungs is near the bottom of the ribs. Superficial refers to more toward the surface of the body. For example, the ribs are superficial to the lungs. Deep means further away from the surface of the body. For example, the heart is deep to the ribs. Some directional terms are used to describe the position of the body rather than the location of body structures in relation to one another. Supine and prone are two examples. Supine means lying horizontally facing upward. Prone means lying horizontally facing downward. On this slide, you have two pictures of the same woman lying in two different positions. In the top picture, the woman is lying in the supine position, that is on her back facing up toward the ceiling. On the bottom picture, the same woman is lying prone, that is flat on her stomach with her head turned sideways. Many of the terms we discussed related to body organization are frequently abbreviated. This slide and the one that follows reviews these abbreviations. I'm not going to read the abbreviations to you as many times they're simply just saying letters, but take a few minutes to run through each of the terms and its definition. This slide has additional body organization abbreviations. 
take note that these are abbreviations, not acronyms. So, for example, left upper quadrant, L-U-Q, you wouldn't pronounce that as luck. You would say L-U-Q. Another important aspect of healthcare that you should understand is the route of administration of drugs. Route of administration refers to the method by which a medication is introduced into the body. To be effective, drugs must be administered by a particular route. In some cases, there may be a variety of routes by which a drug can be administered. For example, Tylenol can be administered by mouth, by rectum, or intravenously. In other cases, the drug must be administered via a particular route. The following slides will review the various routes of administration that can be used. Oral drugs are given by mouth. The advantages of oral drugs are ease of administration and a slow rate of absorption by the digestive system. Disadvantages of oral drugs also include slowness of absorption and destruction of some chemicals by stomach acid. In addition, some medications such as aspirin can have corrosive action on the stomach lining. Sublingual medications are held under the tongue rather than being swallowed. Blood vessels on the underside of the tongue absorb the medication as the saliva dissolves it. The rate of absorption with sublingual medications is quicker than oral drugs. This route is used to administer nitroglycerin for chest pain, for example. On this slide is a picture of a male patient with a nitroglycerin tablet under his tongue. Inhalation includes medications inhaled directly into the nose or mouth. This route is used to administer aerosol sprays. This slide shows a picture of an inhalation medication being administered. This is a classic example, a young girl using a meter dosed inhaler, potentially for asthma. The parenteral route is an invasive method of administering drugs, as it requires the skin to be punctured by a needle. There are several methods of parenteral administration. The intracavitary route involves injection into a body cavity, such as the peritoneal or chest cavity. The intradermal route of administration is a very shallow injection under the epidermis. It is commonly used in allergy testing. The intramuscular route of administration is directly into the muscle of the buttocks, thigh, or upper arm. In addition to the parenteral methods we just looked at on the previous slide, there are three more. The intrathecal route of administration is into the meningeal space surrounding the brain and spinal cord. The intravenous route of administration delivers medication very quickly or by continuous drip into the veins. The subcutaneous route is administered into the subcutaneous layer of skin, usually the upper outer arm or abdomen. The subcutaneous route is often used for insulin injection by diabetic patients. This slide illustrates the angle of needle insertion for four different types of parenteral injections. It's also really good to take note of how one may hold the needle when injecting the medications for each style. Medications administered via the transdermal route are absorbed through the skin. In fact, the word transdermal literally means pertaining to across the skin. Transdermal medications coat the underside of a patch, which can be applied to the skin, where the medication is then absorbed. Examples include birth control patches, nicotine patches, sea sickness patches, and pain patches. The rectal route of administration involves medications introduced directly into the rectal cavity in the form of suppositories or solutions. This route is used if the patient is unable to take them by mouth due to nausea, vomiting, or surgery. The topical route includes medications applied directly to the skin or mucous membranes. These medications come in ointment, cream, or lotion form. They're used to treat skin infections and eruptions. Vaginal medications are inserted directly into the vagina and include tablets, suppositories, and creams. 
These medications are used to treat vaginal yeast infections and other irritations. Eye drops include drops used during eye examinations to dilate the pupil in order to better examine the interior of the eye. They are also placed into the eye to control eye pressure and glaucoma and to treat infections. Ear drops include drops placed directly into the ear canal for the purpose of treating infections or relieving ear pain. Buckle drugs are placed under the lip. They may also be placed between the cheek and gum. Some routes of medication administration have their own abbreviations. They include the following, ID for intradermal, IM for intramuscular, IV, intravenous, SL, sublingual, SUBC or SUBQ for subcutaneous, SUPPOS or SUPP for suppository, and TOP for topical. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the lecture. Be sure to watch any additional lectures on this topic. And of course, you're able to return to this lecture anytime you may need a refresher. Until then, thanks for watching.